Spirituality is a particular term which actually means dealing with intuition. In the theistic tradition, there is notion of clinging into a word. A certain act is regarded as uh, displeasing to a divine principles. A certain act is regarded as pleasing for the divine whatever. In the tradition of non-theism, however, it is very direct that the case history are not particularly important. What is actually important is here and now. Here and now. Now is definitely now. We try to experience what is available there on the spot. There's no point in thinking that the past did exist that we could have now. This is now. This very moment. This very moment. Nothing mystical, just now, very simple, straightforward. And from that nowness, however, arises a sense of intelligence, always, that you are constantly interacting with the reality one by one, spot by spot, constantly. We actually experience fantastic precision, always. But we are threatened by the now, so we jump to the past or the future. Paying attention to the materials that exist in our life, such rich life that we lead. All these choices take place all the time, but none of them are regarded as bad or good per se. Everything we experience are unconditional experience. They don't come along with the label by saying this is regarded as bad, or this is good. But we experience them, but we don't actually pay heed to them properly. We don't actually regard that as a, that we are going somewhere. We regard that as a hassle, waiting to be dead. Waiting to be dead. Waiting to be dead. Waiting to be dead. That's the problem. And that is not trusting the nowness properly, that what is actually experienced now possessed a lot of powerful things. It is so powerful that we can't face it. Therefore, we have to borrow from the past, invite future all the time. And maybe that's why we seek religion. Maybe that's why we march in the street. March in the street. Maybe that's why we complain to the society. Maybe that's why we vote for the presidents. It's quite ironical. Very funny indeed.
the more you begin to investigate what we think we understand, where we came from, what we think we're doing, the more you begin to see we've been lied to. We've been lied to by every institution. What makes you think for one minute that the religious institution is the only one that's never been touched? The religious institutions of this world are at the bottom of the dirt. The religious institutions in this world are put there by the same people who gave you your government, your corrupt education, who set up your international banking cartels, because our masters don't give a damn about you or your family. All they care about is what they have always cared about, and that's controlling the whole damn world. We have been misled away from the true and divine presence in the universe that men have called God. I don't know what God is, but I know what he isn't. And unless and until you are prepared to look at the whole truth, and wherever it may go, whoever it may lead to, if you want to look the other way, or if you want to play favorites, then somewhere along the line you're going to find out you're messing with divine justice. The more you educate yourself, the more you understand where things come from, the more obvious things become and you begin to see lies everywhere. You have to know the truth and seek the truth and the truth will set you free. tell you the truth when it comes to bullshit big time major league bullshit you have to stand in awe of the all-time champion of false promises and exaggerated claims religion think about it religion has actually convinced people that there's an invisible man living in the sky who watches everything you do every minute of every day and the invisible man has a special list of 10 things he does not want you to do and if you do any of these 10 things he has a special place full of fire and smoke and burning and torture and anguish where he will send you to live and suffer and burn and choke and scream and cry forever and ever till the end of time but he loves you. <laughs> he loves you. He loves you and he needs money. He always needs money. He's all powerful, all perfect, all knowing and all wise. Somehow, just can't handle money. Religion takes in billions of dollars, they pay no taxes, and they always need a little more. Now, you talk about a good bullshit story. Holy shit. is the sun. As far back as 10,000 BC, 
History is abundant with carvings and writings reflecting people's respect and adoration for this object. And it is simple to understand why, as every morning the sun would rise, bringing vision, warmth and security, saving man from the cold, blind, predator-filled darkness of night. Without it, the cultures understood, the crops would not grow and life on the planet would not survive. These realities made the sun the most adored object of all time. Likewise, they were also very aware of the stars. The tracking of the stars allowed them to recognize and anticipate events which occurred over long periods of time, such as eclipses and full moons. They in turn cataloged celestial groups into what we know today as constellations. This is the cross of the zodiac, one of the oldest conceptual images in human history. It reflects the sun as it figuratively passes through the twelve major constellations over the course of a year. It also reflects the twelve months of the year, the four seasons, and the solstices and equinoxes. The term zodiac relates to the fact that constellations were anthropomorphized or personified as figures or animals. In other words, the early civilizations did not just follow the sun and stars, they personified them with elaborate myths involving their movements and relationships. The sun, with its life-giving and saving qualities, was personified as a representative of the unseen creator or God, God's sun, the light of the world, the savior of humankind. Likewise, the twelve constellations represented places of travel for God's sun and were identified by names, usually representing elements of nature that happened during that period of time. For example, Aquarius, the water bearer, who brings the spring rains. This is Horus. He is the sun god of Egypt of around 3000 BC. He is the sun anthropomorphized, and his life is a series of allegorical myths involving the sun's movement in the sky. From the ancient hieroglyphics in Egypt, we know much about the solar messiah. For instance, Horus, being the sun or the light, had an enemy known as Set. And Set was the personification of the darkness or night. And, metaphorically speaking, every morning Horus would win the battle against Set, while in the evening Set would conquer Horus and send him into the underworld. It is important to note that dark versus light, or good versus evil, is one of the most ubiquitous mythological dualities ever known, and is still expressed on many levels to this day. Broadly speaking, the story of Horus is as follows. Horus was born on December 25th of the virgin Isis, Mary. His birth was accompanied by a star in the east, and upon his birth he was adored by three kings. At the age of 12, he was a prodigal child teacher. And at the age of 30, he was baptized by a figure known as Anup, and thus began his ministry. Horus had 12 disciples he traveled about with, performing miracles such as healing the sick and walking on water. Horus was known by many gestural names such as the Truth, the Light, God's Anointed Son, the Good Shepherd, the Lamb of God, and many others. After being betrayed by Typhon, Horus was crucified, buried for three days, and thus resurrected. These attributes of Horus, whether original or not, seem to permeate many cultures of the world, for many other gods are found to have the same general mythological structure. Attis of Phrygia, born of the virgin Nana on December 25th, crucified, placed in a tomb, and after three days was resurrected. Krishna of India, born of the virgin Devaki, with a star in the east signaling his coming. He performed miracles with his disciples, and upon his death was resurrected. Dionysus of Greece, born of a virgin on December 25th, was a traveling teacher who performed miracles such as turning water into wine. He was referred to as the King of Kings, God's only begotten Son, the Alpha and Omega, and many others. And, upon his death, he was resurrected. Mithra of Persia, born of a virgin on December 25th, he had twelve disciples and performed miracles, and upon his death was buried for three days and thus resurrected. He was also referred to as the Truth, the Light, and many others. Interestingly, the sacred day of worship of Mithra was Sunday. The fact of the matter is, there are numerous saviors from different periods from all over the world which subscribe to these general characteristics. The question remains, why these attributes? Why the virgin birth on December 25th? 
Why dead for three days in the inevitable resurrection? Why twelve disciples or followers? To find out, let's examine the most recent of the solar messiahs. Jesus Christ was born of the Virgin Mary on December 25th in Bethlehem. His birth was announced by a star in the east, which three kings or magi followed to locate and adorn the new savior. He was a child teacher at 12, and at the age of 30 he was baptized by John the Baptist, and thus began his ministry. Jesus had 12 disciples which he traveled about with, performing miracles such as healing the sick, walking on water, raising the dead. He was also known as the King of Kings, the Son of God, the Light of the World, the Alpha and Omega, the Lamb of God, and many, many others. After being betrayed by his disciple Judas and sold for 30 pieces of silver, he was crucified, placed in a tomb, and after three days was resurrected and ascended into heaven. First of all, the birth sequence is completely astrological. The star in the east is Sirius, the brightest star in the night sky, which, on December 24th, aligns with the three brightest stars in Orion's belt. These three bright stars in Orion's belt are called today what they were called in ancient times, the Three Kings. And the Three Kings and the brightest star, Sirius, all point to the place of the sunrise on December 25th. This is why the Three Kings follow the star in the east, in order to locate the sunrise the birth of the sun. The Virgin Mary is the constellation Virgo, also known as Virgo the Virgin. Virgo in Latin means virgin. Virgo is also referred to as the house of bread, and the representation of Virgo is a virgin holding a sheaf of wheat. This house of bread and its symbol of wheat represents August and September, the time of harvest. In turn, Bethlehem, in fact, literally translates to House of Bread. Bethlehem is thus a reference to the constellation Virgo, a place in the sky, not on Earth. There is another very interesting phenomenon that occurs around December 25th, or the winter solstice. From the summer solstice to the winter solstice, the days become shorter and colder. And from the perspective of the northern hemisphere, the sun appears to move south and get smaller and more scarce. The shortening of the days and the expiration of the crops when approaching the winter solstice symbolized the process of death to the ancients. It was the death of the sun. And by December 22nd, the sun's demise was fully realized. For the sun, having moved south continually for six months, makes it to its lowest point in the sky. Here a curious thing occurs. The sun stops moving south, at least perceivably, for three days. And during this three-day pause, the sun resides in the vicinity of the Southern Cross, or Crux, constellation. And after this time, on December 25th, the sun moves one degree, this time north, foreshadowing longer days, warmth, and spring. And thus it was said, the sun died on the cross, was dead for three days, only to be resurrected or born again. This is why Jesus and numerous other sun gods share the crucifixion, three-day death and resurrection concept. It is the sun's transition period before it shifts its direction back into the northern hemisphere, bringing spring and thus salvation. However, they did not celebrate the resurrection of the sun until the spring equinox, or Easter. This is because at the spring equinox, the sun officially overpowers the evil darkness, as daytime thereafter becomes longer in duration than the night, and the revitalizing conditions of spring emerge. Now, probably the most obvious of all the astrological symbolism around Jesus regards the twelve disciples. They are simply the twelve constellations of the zodiac, which Jesus, being the sun, travels about with. In fact, the number twelve is replete throughout the Bible. Coming back to the cross of the zodiac, the figurative life of the sun, this was not just an artistic expression or tool to track the sun's movement. It was also a pagan spiritual symbol, the shorthand of which looked like this. This is not a symbol of Christianity. It is a pagan adaptation of the cross of the zodiac.
This is why Jesus in early occult art is always shown with his head on the cross, for Jesus is the Son, the Son of God, the light of the world, the risen Savior who will come again, as it does every morning, the glory of God who defends against the works of darkness as he is born again every morning and can be seen coming in the clouds up in heaven with his crown of thorns or sun rays. Now, of the many astrological, astronomical metaphors in the Bible, one of the most important has to do with the ages. Throughout the scriptures there are numerous references to the age. In order to understand this, we need to be familiar with a phenomenon known as the precession of the equinoxes. The ancient Egyptians, along with cultures long before them, recognized that approximately every 2150 years, the sunrise on the morning of the spring equinox would occur in a different sign of the zodiac. This has to do with a slow, angular wobble that the Earth maintains as it rotates on its axis. It is called a precession because the constellations go backwards rather than through the normal yearly cycle. The amount of time it takes for the precession to go through all 12 signs is roughly 25,765 years. This is also called the Great Year. And ancient societies were very aware of this, and they referred to each 2150 year period as an age. From 4300 BC to 2150 BC, it was the age of Taurus, the bull. From 2150 BC to 1 AD, it was the age of Aries, the ram. And from 1 AD to 2150 AD, it is the age of Pisces, the age we are still in to this day. And in and around 2150, we will enter the new age, the age of Aquarius. Now, the Bible reflects, broadly speaking, a symbolic movement through three ages while foreshadowing a fourth. In the Old Testament, when Moses comes down Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments, he is very upset to see his people worshipping a golden bull calf. In fact, he shattered the stone tablets and instructed his people to kill each other in order to purify themselves. Most biblical scholars will attribute this anger to the fact that the Israelites were worshipping a false idol or something to that effect. The reality is, the golden bull is Taurus the bull, and Moses represents the new age of Ares the ram. This is why Jews even today still blow the ram's horn. Moses represents the new age of Ares, and upon the new age, everyone must shed the old age. Other deities mark these transitions as well, such as Mithra, a pre-Christian god who kills the bull in the same symbology. Now Jesus is the figure who ushers in the age following Ares, the age of Pisces, or the two fish. Fish symbolism is very abundant in the New Testament. Jesus feeds 5,000 people with bread and two fish. When he begins his ministry walking along Galilee, he befriends two fishermen who follow him. And I think we have all seen the Jesus fish on the back of people's cars. Little do they know what it actually means. It is a pagan astrological symbolism for the sun's kingdom during the age of Pisces. Also, Jesus' assumed birth date is essentially the start of this age. At Luke 22.10, when Jesus is asked by his disciples where the last Passover would be, Jesus replies, Behold, when ye are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you, bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. This scripture is by far one of the most revealing of all the astrological references. The man bearing the pitcher of water is Aquarius, the water bearer who is always pictured as a man pouring out a pitcher of water. He represents the age after Pisces, and when the Son, God's Son, leaves the age of Pisces, Jesus, it will go into the house of Aquarius, as Aquarius follows Pisces in the procession of the equinoxes. All Jesus is saying is that after the age of Pisces will come the age of Aquarius. Now, we have all heard about the end times and the end of the world. The cartoonish depictions in the book of Revelation aside, 
The main source of this idea comes from Matthew 28.20, where Jesus says, I will be with you even to the end of the world. However, in the King James Version, world is a mistranslation, among many mistranslations. The actual word being used is eon, which means age. I will be with you even to the end of the age, which is true, as Jesus' solar Piscean personification will end when the sun enters the age of Aquarius. The entire concept of end times and the end of the world is a misinterpreted astrological allegory. Let's tell that to the approximately 100 million people in America who believe the end of the world is coming. Furthermore, the character of Jesus being a literary and astrological hybrid is most explicitly a plagiarization of the Egyptian sun god Horus. For example, inscribed about 3500 years ago on the walls at the Temple of Luxor in Egypt are images of the Annunciation, the Miracle Conception, the Birth and the Adoration of Horus. The images begin with Thoth announcing to the Virgin Isis that she will conceive Horus, then Neph, the Holy Ghost, impregnating the Virgin, and then the Virgin Birth and the Adoration. This is exactly the story of Jesus' miracle conception. In fact, the literary similarities between the Egyptian religion and the Christian religion are staggering. and the plagiarism is continuous. The story of Noah and Noah's Ark is taken directly from tradition. The concept of the Great Flood is ubiquitous throughout the ancient world, with over 200 cited claims in different periods and times. However, one need look no further for a pre-Christian source than the Epic of Gilgamesh, written in 2600 BC. This story talks of a great flood commanded by God, an ark with saved animals upon it, and even the release and return of a dove, all held in common with the biblical story, among many other similarities. And then there is the plagiarized story of Moses. Upon Moses' birth, it is said that he was placed in a reed basket and set adrift in a river in order to avoid infanticide. He was later rescued by a daughter of royalty and raised by her as a prince. This baby in a basket story was lifted directly from the myth of Sargon of Akkad of around 2250 BC. Sargon was born, placed in a reed basket in order to avoid infanticide and set adrift in a river. He was in turn rescued and raised by Aki, a royal midwife. Furthermore, Moses is known as the lawgiver, the giver of the Ten Commandments, the Mosaic Law. However, the idea of a law being passed from God to a prophet up on a mountain is also a very old motif. Moses is just another lawgiver in a long line of lawgivers in mythological history. In India, Manu was the great lawgiver. In Crete, Minos ascended Mount Dicta, where Zeus gave him the sacred laws. While in Egypt, there was Mises, who carried stone tablets and upon them the laws of God were written. Manu, Minos, Mises, Moses. And as far as the Ten Commandments, they are taken outright from spell 125 in the Egyptian Book of the Dead. What the Book of the Dead phrased, I have not stolen, became thou shall not steal. I have not killed, became thou shall not kill. I have not told lies, became thou shall not bear false witness, and so forth. In fact, the Egyptian religion is likely the primary foundational basis for the Judeo-Christian theology. Baptism, afterlife, final judgment, virgin birth, death and resurrection, crucifixion, the Ark of the Covenant, circumcision, saviors, holy communion, great flood, Easter, Christmas, Passover, and many, many more are all attributes of Egyptian ideas long predating Christianity and Judaism. Justin Martyr, one of the first Christian historians and defenders, wrote, When we say that he, Jesus Christ, our teacher, was produced without sexual union, was crucified and died and rose again and ascended into heaven, we propound nothing different from what you believe regarding those who you esteem sons of Jupiter. In a different writing, Justin Martyr said, he was born of a virgin, accept this in common with what you believe of Perseus. 
It's obvious that Justin and other early Christians knew how similar Christianity was to the pagan religions. However, Justin had a solution. As far as he was concerned, the devil did it. The devil had the foresight to come before Christ and create his characteristics in the pagan world. Fundamentalist Christianity, fascinating. These people actually believe the world is 12,000 years old. I swear to God. I actually asked one of these guys, okay, dinosaur fossils. He says, dinosaur fossils? God put those here to test our faith. I think God put you here to test my faith, dude. The Bible is nothing more than an astrotheological literary hybrid, just like nearly all religious myths before it. In fact, the aspect of transference of one character's attributes to a new character can be found within the book itself. In the Old Testament, there is the story of Joseph. Joseph was a prototype for Jesus. Joseph was born of a miracle birth. Jesus was born of a miracle birth. Joseph was of twelve brothers. Jesus had twelve disciples. Joseph was sold for 20 pieces of silver. Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver. Brother Judah suggests the sale of Joseph. Disciple Judas suggests the sale of Jesus. Joseph began his work at the age of 30. Jesus began his work at the age of 30. The parallels go on and on. Furthermore, is there any non-biblical historical evidence of any person living with the name Jesus, the son of Mary, who traveled about with 12 followers, healing people and the like? There are numerous historians who lived in and around the Mediterranean, either during or soon after the assumed life of Jesus. How many of these historians document this figure? Not one. However, to be fair, that doesn't mean defenders of the historical Jesus haven't claimed the contrary. Four historians are typically referenced to justify Jesus' existence. Pliny the Younger, Suetonius, and Tacitus are the first three. Each one of their entries consists of only a few sentences at best, and only referred to Christus or the Christ, which in fact is not a name but a title. It means the Anointed One. The fourth source is Josephus, and this source has been proven to be a forgery for hundreds of years. Sadly, it is still cited as truth. You would think that a guy who rose from the dead and ascended into heaven for all eyes to see and perform the wealth of miracles acclaimed to him would have made it into the historical record. It didn't because once the evidence is weighed, there are very high odds that the figure known as Jesus did not even exist. We don't want to be unkind, but we want to be factual. We don't want to cause hurt feelings, but we want to be academically correct in what we understand and know to be true. Christianity just is not based on truth. We find that Christianity was in fact nothing more than a Roman story developed politically. The reality is, Jesus was the solar deity of the Gnostic Christian sect. And like all other pagan gods, he was a mythical figure. It was the political establishment that sought to historize the Jesus figure for social control. By 325 AD in Rome, Emperor Constantine convened the Council of Nicaea. It was during this meeting that the politically motivated Christian doctrines were established and thus began a long history of Christian bloodshed and spiritual fraud. And for the next 1600 years, the Vatican maintained a political stranglehold on all of Europe, leading to such joyous periods as the Dark Ages, along with enlightening events such as the Crusades and the Inquisition. Christianity, along with all other theistic belief systems, is the fraud of the age. It serves to detach the species from the natural world and likewise each other. It supports blind submission to authority. It reduces human responsibility to the effect that God controls everything 
and in turn awful crimes can be justified in the name of a divine pursuit. And most importantly, it empowers those who know the truth, but use the myth to manipulate and control societies. The religious myth is the most powerful device ever created and serves as the psychological soil upon which other myths can flourish. A myth is an idea that, while widely believed, is false. In a deeper sense, in the religious sense, a myth serves as an orienting and mobilizing story for a people. The focus is not on the story's relation to reality, but on its function. A story cannot function unless it is believed to be true in the community or the nation. It is not a matter of debate. If some people have the bad taste to raise the question of the truth of the sacred story, the keepers of the faith do not enter into debate with them. They ignore them or denounce them as blasphemers. It is wrong, blasphemous, and sinful for you to suggest, imply, or help other people come to the conclusion that the U.S. government killed 3,000 of its own citizens.